I want to go back and kind of get you caught up to where we are because it's going to be important for you. The, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica, and he has, uh, he has been there. He has ministered there for several years, and he has, through the, the preaching of the word, the preaching of the gospel, he uses both of those terms, the preaching of the word and the gospel. And uh, it has, uh, the, the word, he says, the gospel has formed or called a people into a community. That, that's kind of the language that he uses. That's very important. He, he didn't go there and save people, he said. He went there with a, with a word, a word from God, and he proved that it was from God because it began to produce something in the, in the lives of the people. What it produced, and this part is also very important, what it produced was uh, in them was love for each other, and that production of love resounded, he said, throughout all of Thessalonica and Macedonia, and, um, and, and so he, is, he, he has left there after the work, but he has concern about their faith, and so he writes back. Uh, that, that's an important part of this because I, I think it challenged us to see that, you know, we, we kind of have this paradigm that says if I go, I share the gospel with somebody, they receive the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and they're kind of secure. I don't worry about them anymore. And the Apostle Paul understood that he would he would have concern for their faith because he knew that affliction could actually render the gospel um, unproductive in their lives. And he was going to disciple them until they began to show the fruit that comes from having received the word. And y'all remember what we said the fruit was? The, the fruit was love. Thank you, Ebony. The fruit was love. It, it, it is how he determined that the seed of the word had taken root in their lives and he rejoiced to see that they loved each other, right? They had love for each other and all people. And so um, he, he is relieved after having heard back from Timothy that they're doing okay. And then at the end of chapter three, and this part's important, this is what Dave read, because um, we're going to talk about a couple of things that I think get misunderstood when they're out of context. Uh, what, what Dave read was Paul's prayer for them at the end of chapter three. He, he, he prayed, first of all, that, that, um, that God, the Lord, would cause their heart to abound even more in love. And then he says, so that, he would establish their hearts in holiness. Y'all got to always listen to the writers of Scripture because they tell you exactly what they want you to know. And he says he wanted the Lord to establish their hearts in holiness. Y'all hear that? So, so where was the, how, how would they obtain their holiness in Paul's prayer? He wanted God to establish it in their hearts. That's going to become important. And then we get to, and he also says, by the way, he says, and he prays that the Lord would, would, would allow them to come to them so that they could make up for what was lacking in their faith. Paul understood there was still some work that needed to be done. And we're going to look a little bit today at what was lacking in their faith. And we're going to begin at chapter four. So just so that you, you can follow me in the passage so that you can see it coming out of the text. I'll, I'll give you sort of a rough outline um, because the, the, in the outline is sort of the flow of where he's going. Um, and, and it's always important for you to be able to see that in the passage, right? To, to see it helps you to grasp it. Um, some, some of y'all probably noticed, I, I, uh, when, when usually when I preach, particularly from an epistle, I, I'll have um, what looks like notes up here. Y'all ever notice that? Um, do do y'all never notice the notes I bring? <laughs> well, I, I do. I bring, I bring some notes. It's not really notes. I scribble on it. But what I, what, what I do, Coach, is um, I'll print out the passage, and I'll print it out in landscape form. And then um, using my word, pro word processor, I will structure the passage grammatically so that I can see how the author is flowing in what he's trying to communicate. 
and it, then it helps me to then see how, how the, the passage is structured. And then I just use his own structure as my outline for the sermon. That, that, that's, how I, that's how I do it. And I want you all to see what I saw when I was studying it. Okay. So Paul is going to ask them to excel in what he knows they're already doing in two areas. In two areas, he's going to say, I know you're already doing this. And he's going to say why he knows they're already doing it. And then he's going to challenge them to excel still more. It's not like he heard from Timothy that they have a problem in this area. He says, I know you're doing these things. I just want you to do them better in two areas. And then in the third thing he's going to do is he is going to, what I believe, address what he thinks is lacking in their faith, which is what he said he, he would hope to do in the previous chapter. Now, so, some people, watch this, Dave, uh, Dave so, some people will say, well, in, in the two things that he's going to mention, they're lacking in their faith. But no, he's going to tell you very clearly, I know you're already doing these things. You don't lack in that area. I just want you to excel. I want you to go above and beyond. Now, Trevor, how do you know, how do you see that? Let me just show you real quick, real quick outline. Look at verse number, at, at verse number one near the end of the verse. He says, uh, that you would excel still more. Y'all see that? And then he's going to talk about that, that first area that he wants them to excel in. And then I want you to look real quickly at the structure. Then look at verse number nine, near the end of verse number nine. He's going to introduce a second thing that he wants them, and there's the words again, to excel still more. Y'all see it? And then it, it, it follows the two things he wants them to excel in. And then beginning at verse 13, he's going to then talk about the area that he does not say they're excelling in or they're doing well in. He does not want them to excel, but he addresses what he thinks may be a, a lack of information or misinformation, which I think then is a clue that it is what they are, their faith is lacking. Are y'all with me? Now, what, what does it mean for us? Why, why do we listen? Remember, it's written for us. It's preserved for the church so that we'll understand that when we get our faith to where it needs to be, there's some places and ways we can excel still more. And then he's going to tell us two uh, ways in which we can excel in the two ways, and then he's going to help what, uh, where we are misinformed. Y'all with me? So let me show you the first uh, area that he wants them to excel still more. Uh, let, let me just tell you, and then I'll walk you through how I got there. He wants them to excel in their sanctification, or uh, another word for it is in their holiness. Are y'all with me? In their sanctification or in their holiness. The word sanctification is, tra is the translated word, but in some of your Bibles, it may even be translated holiness. Now, we've got, we got to walk through this day because there's a whole lot of misconception in the part of the church of Jesus Christ about holiness. We, we will bludgeon folk who are not holy enough for us. But we got to understand this. Now, the reason I had Dave read it is he's going to ask them to excel in holiness. I'm going to show you. Y'all stay with me. I'm going to get there. He's going to ask them to excel in holiness. But he, after he has previously prayed that God would cause their hearts to be established in it. Y'all with me? Because there's, there, now let me just read it to you, then we'll, we'll talk about it. He says, finally, then, we request, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that you, that as you received instruction from us, that, that, that's, that's when we were there, we talked to you about this sanctification and as to how you are to walk and please God. That's, that's the sanctification that, they, that he gave them instruction about. And then he says, y'all see it? Just as you actually do walk. Y'all see it? He says, I know y'all do this already. 
When we were there, we gave you instruction on how you ought to walk, and we know that you already do walk this way. And then he says that you excel still more. Now, he needs to explain that because that's not enough for them. And so beginning at verse number two, he explains himself and he says, for you know what commandments we gave you, because they were there, by the authority of the Lord Jesus, then uh, further explanation, for this is the will of God that you walk in a way that pleases him. This is the will of God. And then he gets emphatic about it and he says, your sanctification. Y'all see it in the passage? So your sanctification, he said, is the will of God. It's God's will that you be holy. Your sanctification. Now, he didn't say that you be sanctified. He said your sanctification. Because, you, you know, um, if he had said that you would, that, that you would be sanctified, it would, it would uh, assume you've already gotten there. Sanctification is always something that's ongoing. Y are y'all with me? Your sanctification. It implies process. It implies it's not finished. So, so wh whatever you think about your sanctification, it's not done yet. Are y'all with me? And so he says, that, that's one of the reasons why he can say excel still more in it. And so he says, that is, and he's going to get more specific, with some re ways for them to excel still more in the sanctification that he already knows they have. Are y'all with me? So watch this. He's going to say, listen, if you're already Sanct in, in this sanctification, if you're already holy, he says, I want to show you how you can excel at what you already are. You're already walking in a way that pleases God. Now, let me show you how to do it better. And here's what he says. He's going to say three things. Can you all see the three things? The three things are marked off. This, this, is, this is why I, I, I do this. Um, Rodney, <clears throat> is what, why I, I structure it grammatically. The, the three things that he's going to tell them to do starts with a that. He says that you abstain from sexual immorality. Y'all see it? And then he says that, you, you, uh, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification. And, and then it, there is another one in verse number six. Y'all see it? And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter. Y'all see how I followed that grammatically? Uh, every chance I get, I'm trying to teach you how to do this on your own. You, but you, can y'all see it? it? Three of them, right there in a row, where he says, so this is how you improve or excel even more in your sanctification. You do this and that and that. And here's the first one he says. <clears throat> that you abstain, he said, from sexual immorality. Now, get this, they're already walking in a way that pleases God. And he says, uh, and here's, here's how you can excel even more, abstain from sexual immorality. Now, the, the word he uses there would encompass any sort of sexual immorality. So don't, 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 um, don't just picture the one, your pet one that you know you do, but others don't. <clears throat> that, that's how we do it, right? This is, this is any of them, right? Uh, it could be fornication. It could be adultery. Um, it, you know, Jesus widened the whole thing. He said it could be lusting after somebody, the whole thing. And he says, you can excel at this sanctification or your holiness by abstaining from sexual immorality. Now, I know that the Apostle Paul understands the culture. I'm not sure we do. <clears throat> because in the Greco-Roman world, there, there was, um, and, and when you were still, uh, when you're not a Christian and you're living in the Greco-Roman world, the culture has at its center sexual immorality that was generally accepted not as something you should abstain from. It was something that people regularly participated in, uh, not much different from our own. Am I right? 
And so when Paul says, I want you to abstain from sexual immorality, he says, you need to come out of the culture that I know you started in so that you can be separated from that. You, you should be known as not being a participant in what I know and you know is culturally acceptable. See, they, um, e even in Thessalonica, there was a there was a, a, a pagan temple where you could go and there were pagan there were temple prostitutes, both male and female, so that uh, you could go and worship. <clears throat> That's what they would call it. But, you know, we'd call it, uh, you know, sexual immorality. It was that prevalent within the culture. And he said, abstain. Abstain from it. That is, make a decision to not participate in what you know is culturally acceptable. So it's really about a changing of their, of their mindset about who they now are and what they can and cannot participate in that they once thought was culturally acceptable. He's changing their thinking. We're going to talk about why in just a minute. He's going to get there. <clears throat> and then he says that each of you, building on, building on it, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, that's strange language to our modern ears, isn't it? He said, know how to possess your own vessel. Your, any, any idea what he means by that? <clears throat> well, the, um, in, uh, in the New Testament uh, context, the vessel was often used as a metaphor for the body. You know, uh, the, the scripture says we have, referring to the gospel, the word of God, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Right. It understood that our bodies acted as a vessel for the for the gospel. And so when I think when Paul says here, each of you need to know how to possess your own vessel, he says you need to know how to take control or possession of your own body and to do it in holiness or sanctification and in honor. Because Paul understands that if, if you participate into some things, you're going to lose possession of your own vessel. Something else will possess your vessel. And he says you need to know how to possess your own. As a matter of fact, Paul had written to the, to the, uh, the Corinthians and told them, whoever you, you, you give your members to, you become a slave of. And he says you need to be in possession of your own vessel. And to possess your own body, he says, in holiness and in, uh, <clears throat> in holiness and in honor. Now, y'all need to look at this very carefully because Paul chose his words very carefully. In inspired by the, by the spirit, Daniel. He says, you need to know how to possess it. Did y'all notice that? He didn't say take control of it. He said know how to. <laughs> y'all know what that implies, Dexter? It, it takes some know-how. That, that's, that's pretty clear, isn't it, Edmund? It, it takes some know-how to possess your own vessel. It implies there's some wisdom that comes with knowing how to do that. And what he wants is for you to know how to. It's not just a matter of willpower. It's a matter of skill. When you know how, you can do it. And I think that's what's always lacking in most cases is that we just don't know how to. Let me, let me, let me, let me give you all this. If, if the king of Israel, David himself, could commit adultery, try to cover it up, had somebody killed to cover it up, you ain't got no shot without know-how. This is a man that God himself said is after my own heart. And if he can fall, brother, you better get some know-how. You don't know how, you better ask somebody. And so he says, each of you, that, that's, that's particular, that's not familiar, individually, you got to know how to possess your own body. Some places you can't go, some things you can't look at, you got to know how, he said. 
<clears throat> and then here's the last one. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter. You, you know why he says that? Because every act of sexual immorality either transgresses or defrauds somebody. Somebody. And he, he says your brother, but y'all know how the New Testament was written, right? It was written in the masculine tense to include everybody. Brother or sister, you defraud and you, you transgress somebody. And he says, make sure that you, no man transgresses his brother in, the, in that matter. The matter on the table is sexual immorality. And, and watch this. He said, because the Lord is the avenger in all of these things. Who's the avenger? He said, just like I warned you when I was there, you don't do that because the avenger in those matters is the Lord. Now, I know for most of us, our motivation is the angry woman. But I promise you, you got more to be concerned about when the Lord is the avenger in those matters. I, 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 lo I love it because uh, um, the, Paul said he is the avenger, not the revenger. <laughs> He's the avenger. The, the, the avenger sets it right. The revenger returns evil for evil. <laughs> but the avenger brings justice. He sets things aright. He, he, he uh, you know, some scripture says he repays, but he sets them right. I, I love it that he is the avenger and not the revenger. He said vengeance is his and he is the avenger in those cases. You, you, you are not alone. The, the Lord always looks after his people if they have been transgressed and defrauded. That's how you can excel still more, he says. <clears throat> and then th this part's important, and Paul has to include it because you've got to have a right understanding of th this, this idea of holiness. He says, verse number seven, this is the reason uh, why you should do those three things, right, and excel at your sanctification. Here's why. It's in verse number seven. He said, for God has not called us for the purpose of impurity. You'll see it. He, he connects the request, not just for your sanctification, but he says it is related to the reason for which God called you. And he said in the negative, because he didn't call you for that. It, it, it implies something very important. God, God calls us to become something for the reasons he calls us. Let me say that. That probably didn't, that didn't register real well. God has purpose behind the reasons he calls us. And he says he didn't call us for Im, Im, uh, impurity. And then watch this. If you're, if you're a casual reader, you, you're going to miss this, Dexter. That's why you got to be a careful reader. And he, what, here's what he does not say. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask y'all to look at what he does say. So he, he, this is what he does not say, because some of y'all are going to read this into the passage. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but for the purpose of sanctification. Is that what he said? Is that what he said? It's not what he said. Y'all see it? What did he say? He called us in sanctification. Now, that's a little convoluted, but Paul has no other choice. He has to say it as it really is. As confusing as it may be for us, that is true. We're not called to sanctification. We're not called for sanctification. We're called in it. Let, let, me, make, let me give you all a picture, right? It would be as if God is here and I'm out there. Near God is holiness, I'm outside of it, and he calls me to it. That's not what it says, but that's the picture that most of us have. Watch this. But here is, God is here, and everything in the sphere of God then becomes holy, 
Am I right? When, when Moses was at the tree, he said, the ground you're on is holy. Why was the ground holy? Because God was there. Right? Says, and so in Jesus Christ, when you're in Christ, you are near to God as near as you're going to ever be. And therefore, you become holy as he is holy. And so you're already in holiness. And then he calls you in it. <laughs> Y'all get it? It, it's the difference between being called to something you're not and being called to excel at something you already are. It, it, it's the difference between trying to become and living up to what you already are. Y'all get the difference? You, by nature of our relationship to God the Father in Jesus Christ, we are holy. We have been sanctified. And so now that we are, here's what he says. God then calls me to that holiness. He calls me in that holiness. He just says, be who you are in me. It, it's, it's just a, it, when you became a Christian, you became all of that. You, 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 were, you were transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. If you are with God, you are in the light. And there is no darkness in him at all. So live like you're in the light. We don't do it not because we've got willpower. We don't do it. We don't engage in sexual immorality because of who we are who we are near to, what he has called us in. It, it, it's, 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 a, it's a profound thing, but it is very true. We're called to live out the righteousness that has been imputed to us. We're called to live up to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We're not called to become anything he transforms us. He births us into this place. And now we just have to live up to our birthright. It says he doesn't simply enable you. He has made you to be. He has called you in sanctification. And he says, now, if God has done that, then the one who rejects this is not rejecting man, but he's rejecting God who gives his Holy Spirit to you, he said. So y'all see it, right? That's the first one. He wants them ex to excel in their sanctification, which he knows they're already doing. And the way to do that is to, ex to, uh, to abstain from sexual immorality and to, to uh, know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor and that no man transgress his brother in that matter. So here's the second one. Watch this. Uh, he, he wants them to excel in the love that they already have. It's verse number nine. Now as to the love of the brethren, y'all see how I got it about love, right? He just says it. He, change, he changes direction. From sanctification, he says, now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need of anyone to write to you. Now this part's interesting. Right, says, he said, you know, when I came, I had to give y'all instruction about the sanctification he said, but nobody had to teach you about the love. For you yourselves are taught by God. Now, don't, 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 don't take that as literal, because, assuming that some people don't need to be taught about love. Here is how Paul knows that they, uh, that, um, that they were taught by God. He says, verse number 10, here's the evidence. For indeed, you do practice it towards the brethren who are in all Macedonia. Y'all get it? This is, not, this is not that hard. This is not rocket science, Donald. He said, uh, I didn't teach you about it. I didn't have to because God taught you because somebody had to have taught you. And I, did, I know I didn't. And you're already doing it. So God has taught you already how to love one another. So do they have a love problem? They do not. He wants them, as he says, but we urge you, brethren, to uh, brethren to excel still more 
And just like he did with sanctification, he's got to show them how to excel. Listen, he, he, he's got three more things. He wants to show them how to excel in love. I want you all to think about this a minute. The, the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Spirit, writes this mention. He's about to tell us how to excel still more in love. And it is not what you ever would have thought, Mimi. I, I promise you, if, if somebody had said, Donald, how can you excel at loving people better? You would have never come up with these three things. <laughs> Listen to what he says. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. <laughs> I love that idea. You know, see, and I love the way he says it. I mean, he, he's so poignant with it. He says, he, he doesn't say lead a quiet life. He said, make it your ambition to. <laughs> Y'all know what ambition is, right? Ambition drives people. You know, some people have an ambition to be successful. They, 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 they determine at a young age they want to be a doctor, and they develop an ambition to becoming a doctor. Their ambition then drives them towards what they want to be and what they want to do. And he says, um, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. I, I love the idea. It, it, it suggests it's hard to love people with noisy lives. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about now. I just made it real, didn't I? Y'all know some people who have noisy lives, don't you? I mean, they, they just bring drama. I mean, it's, it's always something. I mean, they're just complicated people. And he said yeah, that that hinders love abounding. Did y'all know that? So, you know, some of these noisy folk may be fun, but I promise you, they ain't, that fun wears off real fast. I, I, I know some of them. Some of them are in my family. They, they just, I mean, it, issues just follow them. He said, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. A quiet life. That means that's not noisy. And y'all can see, a quiet life is, is really a picture. It, it sounds like some contentment, doesn't it, is in there. You, you can't live a quiet life and always be you know, yearning for something that you can't have. It implies a contentment about life. It, it, it just says, you know, you, it, it's hard for, you know, I, I can't, I, I struggle with whether or not an 18-year-old can do it. They're just always looking for the excitement about life. You know, where, where the lights are going and the, the music's loud and y'all with me? It, it just says, you're you, you always just kind of revved up. The kids call it lit. Yeah, that might be fun for a while, but boy, it's hard to love folk who always lit. <clears throat> and, and then he says, uh, and attend to your own business. <laughs> now, I know some of y'all are already thinking, boy, you, you know, I would love someone so much better if they just mind their business. But, but before you think about them, think about you. Think about you. Attend, because he didn't say, and let them attend to their own business. He said, attend to your own. So think about your own. Attend to your own business. Now, we, we got to, uh, I, I, Coach, because I know how people think, and this comes with age. I know people, uh, Dave, within the church will hear something that causes bells to go off because they like the sound of it. And they already they quickly develop who they're going to tell to mind their business. Right. And so then the minding of your business becomes such an entrenched doctrine that people can't give you advice. They can't visit. They can't do nothing. Right. So there's 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 clearly limits to the attend to your own business. Right. You, you know, Scripture says. If, uh, if a brother is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. Now, if you take mind your own business too far, you'll say, well, yeah, he caught in that sin, but I'm going to mind my own business because Scripture says so. Y'all can see that's too far, right? But, so what does he mean? Where are the limits? 
You, you know, the great thing about it, Rodney, is he doesn't give me the limits. He's trusting that I'm going to have the wisdom to know when I need to mind my own business and when I need to get involved in the life of my brother. And people are going to say, no, you got to define it for me. He does not define it. But um, <clears throat> we, 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 know when, we know some folks who just don't mind their business, though, don't we? Yeah, you might be one of them. You know, it, it's, it's like when Paul says that, that no, none of us should be found to be a troublesome meddler. It's the difference between seeing a brother in need and poking your nose into his business to find out what he's doing. You know, searching for their issues. What's he doing? Peeping around corners. Where is he going? That's the difference. Have you, any of y'all ever known a, a, a church busybody? I, I'm, <laughs> so, so yeah, I've known some. Yeah, I've known some too. Um, and, in, and in my immaturity, I was probably one of them at one time. And the real issue is, are you? And he says, listen, if you're going to exceed, excel still more in love, then you got to determine that you're going to live a quiet life and that you are going to attend to your own business. That's what he said. Attend to your own business. And he says, and work with your hands just as we commanded you. Y'all know the, the work with your hands says do what? Come on, say it in our, in our colloquial term. Provide for yourself. Do what it takes to provide for yourself. Now, don't take that and doctrinize it because you know of that, that so-and-so that you're going to tell off. You're going to say, you know, the Bible says you need to get a job. But, you know, Christian people say that about the homeless on the corners every day, don't we? Ah, no, no, Scripture said he don't work, he don't eat. Scripture also says help those who are in need. But this says... As much as you can, work with your hands so that, y'all see, the, so that verse number 12, you will behave properly towards outsiders. That's the thinking you're supposed to have. Who are the outsiders in this case? Those who are outside of the church and not be in any need. I, it, nothing strains love like somebody who's always who can work and won't work and are always in need. So he says, you need to do whatever it takes so that you can work with your own hands, make your own living, so that you don't cause your brother to strain to love you, and you get strained when your brother says, I don't have any more to keep giving you. Because, you know, the Bible's realistic. It happens, doesn't it? Sure, sure it does. So on your part, do, do what it takes. Do, make, make the effort. Now, there, there are going to be times, and it is clear, George, there are times where you need help. We all, at some point in our lives, need help. We've, everybody falls on a hard time. And that's not the time to say, well, I'll just keep trying to work to do my own thing. It's okay to ask for help. But when you can, work with your own hands, provide for yourself, take care of your own needs. Now he says three things there. Quiet life. And then he says, your own business, get a job. You do those things, love will excel. It, it's really, it really pretty, it's pretty clear. You, 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 um, I, I've been married for 31 years. And you, it, it's, it's just like clockwork. Y'all know when we struggle the most in our, in our relationship? When we don't have enough money. It, I, I, try to, I try to tell um, y young people this all the time. W when you are young, work with your hands, with your young hands. Build some stability, and you can build families that's not going to fight all the time. You, you can excel still more in love if you're not looking at each other when the lights go out. <laughs> it's 
sometimes the Bible can just be really practical, can it? Just, God just sort of knows us, doesn't he? And then here is, um, here is the third. This is where they're lacking in their faith. And by the way, this is where I think most modern Christians are lacking in their faith. I'm going to get through this one pretty quickly because I know I've extended my time. But here is, here is the last one. I want you to see it unfold in the passage. And he says, but that's in contrast to, I believe, the two things you're doing well. He says, but I do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. About what? He says, about those who are asleep. Y'all know what he means by that? Everybody knows what he means when he says asleep? He means those who have died. Now, the Bible generally talks about death in terms of sleep because the Bible has its eye on what God is going to do. And so he says, those who are asleep. And he says, so that. He says, I don't want you to be unaware about this so that because when you are unaware, he says, you might just grieve like the rest do who have no hope. When you are biblically informed about those who have died, the hope you have causes you not to grieve like the rest. You may grieve, but not like the rest do. You grieve with hope and not without it. Now, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me share this with you, because some of y'all grieve um, thinking you have hope, but you grieve like you have no hope. If you believe that your loved one who has died in Christ has died and gone to heaven and they will live in heaven forever with God, you're grieving with no hope. Did y'all hear me? Did, did, that, did that shake some of you? If you believe they're going to walk streets of gold in heaven just like that forever, you're grieving with no hope. Or, it's a, it's a, or at best, it's a false hope. It's a made-up hope. It's a manufactured hope. It's a, it's a mythological hope. But it's not a biblical hope. I, I believed that for a long time. I hear people used to say it all the time. They're, they're with God and they're going to be there forever, just like that. But if that's so, if that is true, if they died and they're going to live now with God in heaven, they will be forever dead. Am I right? Listen, my grandmother believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. She died. But I don't fool myself, she's dead. Some people say, when, when you die, that's when you live. No, you are dead. Y'all need to see it, because y'all are looking at me with that look that says, you got to show me. Because here's the Christian hope. Look at verse number, number uh, 14. He explains. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, or we ought to also then believe God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Now, he's made a very important point. He says, listen, there's no reason to believe that Jesus died and rose if you don't believe that your loved one died and will rise again. He says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose and even so, just like that, we should believe that those who have fallen asleep, Jesus will bring with him when he returns. Our hope is the hope of the resurrection, the resurrection of the body. Only if God resurrects the body does death lose its sting. Death will then be conquered when God tells your loved one who is asleep to get up. When he awakens them. 
So we, we don't hope for heaven, we hope for the resurrection. He, heaven's a good, heaven's real, I believe it. Don't get me wrong, I believe it's real. And I believe in the interim, they are with God in heaven because that's where he is. But you're not going to spend an eternity in heaven. Your body will be resurrected to live on the new earth that God will create. And that's when death will have lost its sting. That's our hope. We hope for the resurrection. And that's why we believe in the Lord Jesus' death and resurrection. That's why Paul called him the first fruit. The first fruit of much to come after. And he says, explaining even further, for this we say by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain, that, that's those who have not died yet, who have not fallen asleep, uh, until the coming of the Lord, will not, he says, precede those who have fallen asleep. He says, you don't have to worry about those who have fallen asleep. Because listen, even if we are alive and we're here when Jesus returned, we will not precede them. It's not like God has left them behind. It's not like you have to endure to the end and alive and be alive and remain to be saved. He says, we will not precede them for the Lord himself. I love that emphatic. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, you, you know, all of those, that, those string of ways in which he will descend, it, it, it implies when, when, when he descends, there's going to be a great noise about it. There's going to be a shout, voices of a, a voice of an angel and a trumpet. Don't get it confused. Don't let somebody whisper in your ear that Jesus has come and he's over in Arizona somewhere. No, when he comes, you're going to hear it. Shout, angel, trumpet, he has come. And then it says, and the dead in Christ will rise, what? First. And this, that says, if you are alive and you remain, you're going to see them go up first before you do. <laughs> I love that idea. You know, my, my, my sister's been gone now for a while. Nothing, nothing has ever affected me like the death of my sister. She, she died from, uh, from a very aggressive brain cancer. And to have watched it happen to her was very disturbing to me. I mean, I, I watched her endure grand mal seizures, where when she came to, she didn't know where she was. I, I, I watched her lose her um, cognitive ability to do almost everything, including chew her food. She, she'd take it, but she wouldn't chew it. The, 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 uh, I don't know, the, the, the synops synapses that said, okay, now that you have food chew, it was just gone. And so she just keep it. And I, I watched her deteriorate that way. And it, it really just sort of, it, it gnawed at me. And I, you know, through the whole process, I'm watching coach and I'm saying, this is not right. It's not supposed to happen. Like, you know, something's bad about this thing. And, and, and then, you know, p people would say, but when she dies, she, she's, she's gone to a better place. She, she's with the Lord and, you know, that's good. But I, I, I want to see her. And I don't want to see her as some fuzzy, ethereal, spiritual being that I may and may not recognize. I want to see her. And, and watch this. And at some moment in time, determined by the Father, we're going to hear the shout, the angel, the trumpet, and right out of paradise south, she's going to get up. I, I don't, yeah, she's buried six feet deep, but I don't think when the shout comes, the ground is going to be a problem. She's going to get up. And she's going to get up before I go up. I will watch her ascend to meet the Lord in the air. My joy will be made complete already before I start going up. But it says, then, verse 17, we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. 
in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's the hope. You'll see it. That's the Christian hope. The Christian hope is resurrection, not heaven eternally. It's the resurrection. And so we shall always be with the Lord, never to be separated from him again after that. That, that caught up is the Christian's word for rapture. One of the few places, by the way, that is there. But it is there. Be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Rapture. It, the, the word seen, the, the word, it's an interesting word, Dexter, because it, the, the word actually means taken by force. Snatched up in some cases. It, it says, the Lord will use a power that no man can keep me here because he will use his own force to take me to be with Jesus. Snatch me away from here. And then he says to them, closing words of the chapter, closing words I leave with you. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Because those are comforting words, amen? Amen.